Welcome to Salem Methodist Church. We're happy to see each of you this morning, um, and we're we're very glad that you're here to join us in uh, worship on the second Sunday of Advent. Christmas is quickly approaching. Um, thanks to everyone that helped decorate uh, Hanging at the Greens. It's beautiful. It's one of my favorite. Um, Christmas and Easter, the sanctuary is just uh, beautiful. So. Um, we have a card for the church to our Salem uh, church family. Hope, hoping his love lights your way through a beautiful Christmas and a very happy new year. Love, Anne and Brenda Stum. So, okay. Your upcoming events in the bulletin um, on the bottom right. Um, there's lots of things listed there. We'll go through the uh, congregation and see who has better information than me before we go through the list. Okay. Hi, I'm Virginia Cross. in case you don't know me. And if you don't, it's not my fault. <laughs> I wanted to remind you about the tea lights for the people that weren't here last Sunday. The tea lights, the baskets are out there. If you, um, if you have any friends that you know or relatives that should be going to church on Christmas Eve, please share a tea light with them and give it to them. They are to be given away. They are not gifts from me to you. They are for us to spread the word and the light and the joy of Jesus. Also, last week, I didn't tell you that what I do is I put it, two or three of them in a Ziploc bag and then put it in my church so that they don't get mashed. But be sure and grab some on the way out. And, um, and then also there's something else I wanted to tell you about because it's about how wonderful this church family is. I made a suggestion about a month ago and it was to get the little racks back here that are on these pews over there because that is usually where our visitors sit and the information about our church and the calendars are over, stuck over in the corners so I asked Mark if he would consider doing something like that where's your little piece of wood that you showed me and this is hard to do. And he has come up with these. And they're made out of pine. And he makes them himself. They're handmade for all of the backs of the pews that eventually will go up there. Now that's the kind of congregation this is. You drop a few words down and you say, gee, it would be nice if we had a place to put our, our little envelopes and the calendars and things on those pews over there. And there they are. How, how can you thank someone enough for that? 
<laughs> I know, but he's doing it. And everyone here does a lot of things silently, like Mark would have never told anyone. And those of us that get stuck in our pews over here, that never sit over there, would have never known that he had done that. But he did, and he is. And that's the way everyone in this church is. I have never had anyone say no if we needed something for the youth group so that they could go to Kings Island or anything like that over the last 40 some years that I've been here. Our prayers have always been answered and people have always helped out. So thank you, Mark, and thank you to the congregation. Good morning. I think you all see how beautiful our sanctuary looks with all the decorations that have been put in it. But we also have something else coming up, and that's our poinsettias, who will be here uh, on Christmas Eve for the morning and evening service. Um, we're very lucky. They kept the price the same as it was last year, so they're $10 a piece. Um, I have envelopes I'm going to pass around here. Put your name on it as you want it listed in the bulletin, and we'll just do them all in honor of loved ones, or in memory of loved ones. Um, so I just need your, uh, your money in here and you to fill this out. When you have finished that, if you'll drop it in the offering plate or see that it gets back to me. Uh, and we'll be doing this again next week. So if you don't have your money with you, you haven't decided if you want it yet, you'll have a chance next week too. Thank you. Yes, good morning, I'm Tina. Uh, just a reminder to all the Salem ladies about our lunch this Thursday, come to Stone Creek about 11.15, and we'll have a wonderful time. Even if you uh, have not signed up and you discover you can join us, uh, that's wonderful, please come on over. And uh, they're very good about uh, pulling up another chair, so we're fine with that. See you there. Good morning, I'm Bill, and uh, just wanted, there's a note in the bulletin, but wanted to thank everyone for Salem's donations to Fletcher Place. Um, as a result of our donations and others, there were 86 families serviced this year, so each child will get some clothing, a uh, gift of some kind, and the families also will get food and uh, household goods like uh, laundry soap, et cetera, that uh, needy families are gonna be very, Please this year, and the program just uh, ended up distri distributing things yesterday. Thank you all. While you're walking back, Denise, um, I would like to just take a second to kind of give a plug. Um, any of you that need something good to do for about two and a half hours, um, Netflix has, uh, I can only imagine, uh, the movie on. Netflix. I think we've got it on CD, different things, but we watched it again last night, and it's an amazing movie. Um, if you need something to kind of lift your spirits, uh, it's not one of the traditional Christmas uh, shows that come on, but I can only imagine is an excellent movie to watch if you need to get a little boost to your day. Thank you. I'm um, reporting that Andy is doing very well, and we'll see how well he's done when he goes to the doctor on Tuesday, but he still needs your prayers. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I had to ask for prayers for my mother as she's a uh, um, trans, I don't know what the word is, from her house to um, assistant living. Um, we have sold the house. Um, she has decided where she's going. So we have um, a few weeks to clean out her house. <laughs> 
So prayers for mother for a smooth transition. That's the word I was looking for, for a smooth transition. Okay. Good morning. I'm Paula. Um, two things. Um, you might notice there aren't many children here this morning. Um, and that's been happening a lot lately. So um, I'm going to give you a heads up that I may need a few grown-ups to be stand-in to help with the Christmas program next week. So if you already know you're real willing to do that, you could see me after church. And if you don't volunteer, please don't tell me no when I ask you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, it was... <laughs> My son-in-law this morning pointed out something to me. Um, on the prayer list, you'll notice that the first prayer says, prayers for those in authority over us. Perhaps I should have put quotation marks. I wasn't here last week, but the minister who spoke to you repeated that phrase multiple times in reminding us the importance of praying for those in our government and who are over us in authority in our society. But we all know that the Lord has the ultimate authority. So, on behalf of my son-in-law, I thought I would make that clarification for you. And I'd like to ask for prayers. For Bill Webb, please. Uh, my my brother-in-law um, is having a knee replacement surgery this Thursday. So prayers for him and his wife, who's going to try to take care of him. And he cannot always be the best patient. Thank you. Hi, my name's Ruth. Um, my friend Sayla, her little sister Mariah, has a lung infection. And she also has a few other health concerns. So prayers for the Steinbach family. I probably need to remind people or let you know <clears throat> it's been about four months since I've been able to get one of the videos actually edited and onto the internet and uh, uploaded to YouTube um, did that yesterday with last week's uh, service so if you need the link to get to that I can send that to you uh, you know how they always say you don't realize how much you're gonna miss somebody until you miss them um, Kathy and Martha took care of our communications for so long um, and I really depended when we did the videos when we were out in the tent Kathy you know like two hours after I got them uploaded she had to list out to people in the link and I'm not that good um, so I'm trying to get it I'm gonna try really hard to have every week have the video back up and going uh, and I'm just not sure exactly how we get that out there. One way you can do it is you can go to the church's webpage and click on the video link and it will take you to the most currently uploaded. Now what I'm worried about there is if I go back and get a few of these Sundays in the past couple of months that I haven't been able to get completed, then those would be the ones you'd see not necessarily on Sunday. So there might be a glitch. You may have to look for the most current one. So. Um, Look at the dates, yes, as they're on there. So, all right. Thank you very much. Um, after service today, did we talk about the cheer bag? Oh, no. Okay. I think the, uh, the women's group is uh, working to fill the cheer bags today after church. So um, if you came through Fellowship Hall, they've started setting stuff up, but I'm sure they would welcome extra hands to fill the baskets and um, just uh, get those ready to take out to people to deliver some Christmas cheer and let them know that um, their Salem family is thinking about them. And the Advent books are in the back. So um, if you need one of those yourself or if you have someone that you think might enjoy that, they're in the vestibule on the counter available for you to take and use or share. Okay. 
Our song of preparation today is Sweet, Sweet Spirit on page number 334. morning. Would everyone please rise and join me in the call to worship. Our call to worship this morning is the responsive reading found on page 806 of Psalms 85 verses 1 through 13. Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Let me hear what God will speak, for the Lord will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to the Lord in their hearts. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, righteousness and peace will kiss each other. The Lord will give us what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Our hymn of adoration will be That Boy Child of Mary on page 241.
If you'll now turn to page 881 and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. Tina, I think I figured a way out we can get more people in the choir. We're going to turn the temperature down and wear robes more often. Yes. Okay. Everybody will want to have a robe on. It's warm. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is Isaiah 40 verses 1 through 11. Subtitled, The Comfort for God's People from the New International Version. Comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has re received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry out? All people all people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers in the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are, gra are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord, Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lamb in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This ends the reading of Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 11. Let's bow together and join our hearts and our minds and our thoughts in prayer to our Lord and Savior. Dear God and Father of us all, we are children, and Lord, we're called by your name. Father, we come to you today in the name of our elder brother, our Savior, our Lord and Messiah, our Master Jesus. Father, as your children, you've crowned us with glory and honor. People are beginning to talk more often about peace on earth, goodwill toward mankind, but 
Father, as we look around, we see little peace and goodwill being put into practice today. That must grieve your heart to see the way we treat others. Yet we know that, Father, you want us to, you want to give us your peace. It's not peace like the world talks about. Your peace, the peace that your word says passes all understanding. Oh, Father, today we pray against the enemy's lie, lies that busyness is the only road to success. Even when the busyness tends to take over the calendar. We pray, Father, that even in this very busy season we may rest in your presence and in the peace you give us. We read in your word that Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Father, we know that's your will for us, but dear Lord, it's difficult at times. We're reminded of your constant love and care for us, and we thank you for that. We have many concerns in our hearts and minds, some spoken, many unspoken, but you already know everything that's going on in our hearts, so, but we thank you for the precious gift of prayer, of allowing us to bring these things and lay them before you, and as we Lift these requests and thanksgivings be before you. Mercifully, please provide us peace and comfort. We continue to pray for peace in Israel and Jerusalem. Please give wisdom to the leaders involved and give them a desire, a true desire for peace in their hearts. Please cover the innocent with your shield and Cloak them from the enemy. Today, Father, we join our hearts together, confessing our sins to you and praying aloud together the prayer you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All of us have, or at least have had, maybe at some time in the past, that, Im that impossible person on your gift list. You know the kind of person I'm talking about. The person that has everything. And, and we think, what can we give this person? How can we come up with a, an appropriate gift? What, what do we give the person that has everything? Well, Christmas, I remind you, is Christ's birthday. So what do you give Christ? I mean, he's the creator and sustainer of the universe. Through him, the Bible says, all things were made. Without him was nothing made that has been made. He's the owner of everything. God said, every animal in the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills, and the creatures of the field are mine. For the world is mine, and all that's in it. Now there's somebody that literally has everything. What do you give somebody that has everything? There may be only one acceptable gift for that person. The one thing he doesn't have. And he doesn't have it because he gave it to us. He gave us our lives. And we give him our life when we accept him as our Savior and as our Lord. And that's a gift that, that we must continually give daily. Jesus said... If anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me daily. When Jesus gave us our lives, that included everything. And when we give our lives back to Jesus as our gift, it has to include everything. 
our time, our talent, our testimony, our treasure, everything. You see, money is no more than coined life. You work for an hour and you get paid twelve, fifteen, twenty dollars an hour, whatever it is. That that money represents that much of your life. You see, money is a representation of our lives. And so what we do with our money is exactly what we're doing with our lives. We give that much money to God, we've given that much of our lives to God. So as we receive our offering, I raise this question for you to ponder. Where is your life today? The giving of our money is the offering of, and offering is representation of our lives. And as we give our money today, let's realize that really this is a representation of what God has given to us. The people will come forward to receive our offering at this time. thank you for the lives that you've life that you've given to us we return a portion of that which represents our lives with gratitude for what you have given to us through Christ our Lord we pray amen
Okay, if the kids would like to come up, kids of any age. Grandma, why don't you come up with All Ruthie? Right, Grandma. Sure. All right. I can use a refresher course. <laughs> oh. Okay. And we'll get Grandpa over here too. Right there we go. Okay. This is the privilege of being in the choir. We'll take new members anytime. <laughs> okay. What is the season that we are in? Advent. Advent, right. And what does Advent mean? Coming. Coming. What's coming? Jesus. He's a baby Jesus. That's right. He's coming as a baby. And he grew up to be our Savior. Now, how else does he come to us? Every day. In our hearts, right. And Christ will come again to all Christians. Uh, yeah, I think I am on. Okay, I'll go see. Sure. Uh, this morning we have our wreath here. And what shape is it in? It's a circle. It's a circle. Okay. Where's it start? No beginning, no end. Oh, no end either. Okay. And the circle has no beginning and no end and just as God's life is everlasting. Uh, and then we have the evergreens, which are always green. They represent everlasting life, growth, and hope. Now, what was our candle last week? Candle of hope, right. Okay. Um, yeah, you go get the light for us, okay? The first candle we call the candle of hope. This candle reminds us that God gave us a gift of hope, life forever with him. So let us light the first candle of hope. And if you want to do that. Now, what is our second candle? Do you remember that from <laughs> the candle of peace? Sometimes it's also called the candle of Bethlehem or light or preparation. The candle of peace reminds us that Jesus came to bring peace and goodwill. So let us light our candle of hope. In Luke 2, 13, 14, we read, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now like the Advent candle too, think of heavenly harmony, angels singing peace on earth at the blessed Savior's birth. Candle, candle, burning bright, shining in the cold winter night. Candle, candle, burning bright, fill our hearts with Christmas light. So let us pray. Oh God, we thank you that your angels sang to the shepherds. Glory to God and peace on earth. Amen. Okay, we'll let you take your seats now. And if you would turn to page 218 and join in singing the first verse of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear.
We don't usually spend much time reading or studying the genealogies of Jesus. Most people consider them boring and unimportant. <laughs> Someone suggested, kind of tongue-in-cheek, that make a pretty good list of unusual names for your kids. I'd hate to think some kid was saddled with some of the names in those genealogies. But family trees are interesting and frightening sometimes. Some people make a hobby of of tracing family tree. Other people actually make a living doing that. There have been folks who in tracing their family trees have found some very interesting famous people back in their history. And others have found some real scoundrels, people they just as soon not have as a part of their fa family heritage. These genealogies of our Lord found in Matthew and, Ly and Luke are not just whimsical list of names from some dark, deep, distant past. Believe it or not, there are some tremendous lessons to be learned from these listings, the genealogies. However, Scripture gives us two very important warnings about genealogies in general and about these gene genealogies in particular. The scriptures warn us to avoid foolish, needless, endless genealogies. The Apostle Paul, writing in uh, his letter to 1 Timothy, said this, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrine any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. These promote controversy rather than God's work, which is by faith. And he wrote to Timothy in his letter to Timothy and said, Avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. But these genealogies in Matthew and Luke, the genealogies of our Lord, they are neither foolish nor need needless, nor are they endless. As we're going to see, they come to a definite end, a complete ending. Now, these genealogies, secondly, of our Lord, are not comprehensive. We need to understand that. That is, they do not include every single name in each bloodline. They're, they're highly selective in the names that they choose to list, to list in the genealogies. So, we can learn from them today because they speak of our, our Messiah, our Christ, our Lord, the one who is sent from God to be our Savior and our Master the one whose birth we're celebrating this month. And I thought it would be a good time to kind of, for my part, kick off our celebration in December, talking about these and learning from the genealogy. You say, well, what can we learn from them? Well, we can learn, why are these listings in the Bible? What good are they? How do they help us become a Christian, or at least a growing Christian? My goal, folk, I'll be honest to admit to you, my goal in this message today is to have you think a little. This is not a sleepy Sunday morning tidbit. I hope you brought your snorkels with you, because we're going to dive deeply into the Word of God. There are four promises from this pedigree that I want us to glean today. The first one is this. These pedigree, this pedigree, they prove beyond a doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ, whose birth we're celebrating this month, and every time we have the Lord's Supper, as today, also, we will celebrate the nation of Israel and the family of, out of which the Messiah was to come. Matthew was a Jew, and as a Jew, he wrote to Jews, the Jews would have regard for two specific important points. Number one, 
their prophets had declared that the Messiah had to descend from the royal line of David. God had promised Abraham on two separate occasions that in his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He promised him that at the time he was called, and secondly, he promised him at the time that he was, was told to sacrifice his son Isaac, his only son. David and Abraham were the two greatest ancestors of Jesus. And it was predicted that the Messiah would be their descendant. It was promised to each of these two men that Messiah would descend from him. Therefore, unless Jesus is a son of David and a son of Abraham, he's not the Messiah and he would not be accepted by any Jew as the Messiah. Now I need to point out, and you need to remember as we go through this study, that the word son, S-O-N, is often used in the Bible to simply mean a descendant. And that's usually the context when it says he was the son of someone, it's saying he was the descendant of someone. So Matthew, a Jew, writing to Jews, shows that Jesus is Messiah because he traces Jesus' ancestry to show he is a descendant of Abraham, the father of the faithful, the conqueror, the magnificent and victorious leader of the people of God. I call your attention to what it says in the, in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter, chapter 1 and verse 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and son of Abraham. It's talking about descendant here in this particular verse. Matthew traces the Lord's descent through the royal line of David and Solomon. He begins with Abraham to trace the line down. He's writing to Jews now, remember, and Jewish history begins with Abraham. That's where Jewish history starts. But it's an entirely different story for Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke is a Gentile, and he's writing to Gentiles. In his genealogy, Luke shows that Jesus was the seed of the woman that should break the serpent's head according to the prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So he traces Jesus' line up to Adam, beginning with Eli. Now this, this man Eli, sometimes it's called Eli or sometimes it's spelled with an H, Heli, same guy. He traces the uh, beginning with Eli, the father. He traces it all the way up to father, the father of Mary, not Joseph. And as Matthew traces Jesus' line through Joseph, who is the legal father of Jesus, because he was married to Mary, Luke traces the line through Mary. You see, both Joseph and Mary descended from David, but in different lines. They were cousins many, many times removed. And as Jesus was not the son of Joseph, it was important to show that Mary was also a descendant from David, thus making Jesus a part of the royal line. G Joseph descended through Solomon, David's younger son, and his is the royal line. Mary descended through Nathan, David's older son, and he is the legal line. And as, as Mary's husband, Joseph was the legal father of Jesus. And Matthew gives his line of descent uh, that way. The Jews regarded only the male. Now, you ladies, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it was. The Jews regarded only the male descent. Unless Joseph, the supposed, and Luke, Luke uh, 3.23 says, Joseph, who is the supposed father of Jesus, as the father of Je as supposed father of Jesus, he was a descendant of David also. So, the Jews would not have recognized the genealogy as a fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus 
was the son of David, unless he was descended through the royal line. So, Luke gives us this line. Like, Luke, a Gentile, writing to Gentiles, was more particular to give the line that shows that Jesus is really the son of David through his mother's lineage. Now, if Mary was the daughter of Heli, and she was, especially if she were an heiress, Joseph, by marriage, would become the son of Heli. Now, notice that Matthew does not say Jesus, Joseph begat Jesus. It doesn't say that. While Matthew's concern is the lineage of Jesus that is led mistakenly through David, for the reason I stated earlier, Messiah had to be a descendant of David, the great king, back to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. But Luke, Luke's purpose in writing is, is even greater and wider than that. Luke wants to identify the, line of, the life of Jesus not only with one nation, but with all mankind, Jew and Gentile. So he traces the lineage all the way to Adam through David's son, Nathan, the older son. Luke 3.38 says that Adam was the son of God, and that means that Adam was not merely a creature, but a creature who was created in God's image and in God's likeness. Now, through his, throughout his writings, Luke consistently represents Jesus as lover and redeemer of all people everywhere, both Jew and Gentile. Jesus is brother and Savior and Lord to all who will ex accept him as such. And this leads us to a second promise from this pedigree. The mission of Christ will always include all people. Folk, look at the variety of people in these genealogies. You have adulteresses and adulterers, David, Bathsheba, Tamar, the incestuous daughter-in-law of Judah. You have murderers, David, Saul, later called Paul, and all those wicked kings and other people. You have harlots, Rahab, Mary Magdalene, and others. You have wicked, evil, foolish kings, Rehoboam, Ahijah, Manasseh, Ammon, Joram. And you have good, godly kings, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Uzziah, and Josiah. And here's the, here's the, here's the interesting thing. Even when you're included, you ladies aren't left out after all. Women are included. It was very, very unusual for a woman's name to be included in Jewish genealogies. But there was Tamar, Rahab, the heathen and harlot of Jericho, Bathsheba, Ruth, a foreigner, a heathen, a Moabitess, who, by the way, is one of the sweetest women in the Bible. And all three of these women were Gentiles. Three of them were. Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. Folk, the message here is clear. The Jesus of Luke was the Savior and not only of the children of Abraham, but also the of the children of Adam as well. Who but God? Who but God could have produced a perfect man from such a pedigree? Yet the eternal God gave his perfect son whose mission was to save his people, all people. Now note, here's another lesson for us. Just as all sorts of people were touched in Christ's pedigree, all sorts of people are saved. The Bible says, whosoever will may come. That's the scriptural teaching in this matter of who will be saved. Whosoever will may be saved. There are all sorts of people in the church. Even you and I are here. Welcome. Yeah, surprise, surprise. We're here too. 
And we're all sorts of people. And also, God used these people, Rahab the harlot, to save uh, the spies. He used David the adulterer and murderer, Ruth the Moabitess and others. He used them when they became usable, when they became cleansed. So the question to us today then is, are we available as vessels in God's hand to bring Christ to the whole world? We're not perfect, but neither were all these other people. I told you, adulterers, murderers, wicked people. These early servants weren't perfect either. But when we are cleansed by the saving blood of Christ, then we must take the saving gospel to all sorts and colors and classes of people. The third promise from this pedigree. The pedigree proves the virgin birth. These genealogies, which differ provide good evidence that our Lord had to be born of a virgin. First of all, the prophecies were that Messiah would be born of a virgin. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 is a direct quote from Isaiah 7, 14. Let me read that. And this is a direct, it's, Matthew is a direct quote from this verse in Isaiah. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call his name Emmanuel. These two genealogies, they are the same from Abraham to David. And then as we said, Matthew comes down by the way of Solomon, the royal line, the younger son of David, the successor to the throne of David. And Luke comes down to Jesus by, by, the way, by way of Nathan, the older of the two sons of David, the legal line. The two genealogies are the lines of two brothers, and the children become cousins many, many, many times removed. Matthew gives the genealogy of Joseph. Luke gives the genealogy of the Virgin Mary. Nathan was the older brother of Solomon, but the younger brother became king. Nathan's line continued through the centuries, and it culminated in the Virgin Mary. Now Solomon's line ultimately produced Joseph, and as I said earlier, Matthew does not say that Joseph begat Jesus. Now, there's a reason for all this. I... I briefly reviewed what we said earlier to help you. Now, folk, uh, I hope you brought your snorkels, because now raise them higher. We're going to go deeper in the word. Put up your snorkels. In tracing the royal line to Joseph, there is one name, Jeconias. Sometimes it's also called Jehoiachin. Jeconias, uh, one name, had to be removed. And that name proves the virgin birth, well, as much as anyone can prove it, at least it proves that Joseph could not have been the father of our Lord. Jeconias, or Jehoiachin, as he's sometimes called in the scripture, was under a curse. And you need to understand this. I want us to, I want us to turn to Jer Jeremiah, and chapter 22 and verses 24 and following. This is what it says about Jeconias. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jeconias, or Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, I would still pull you off. I will hand you over to those who seek your life, those you fear to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to the Babylonians. I will hurl you and the mother who gave you birth into another country where neither of you was born, and there you will both die. You will never come back to the land you long to return. Is this man Jehoiachin a despised, broken pot, an object no one wants? 
Of course. Why will he and his children be hurled out, cast into a land they do not know? O oh, land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Record this man as if childless, a man who will not prosper in his lifetime, for none of his offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David, nor rule any more in Judah. His line was cursed. The line of Jehoiachin was cursed. And that name had to be included because that name is very important. The Messiah could not be the seed of Jeconiah because no man of his seed shall prosper. No man of his seed shall rule on David's throne. Yet, regarding the one who was to be the Messiah, the prophet Isaiah is very clear in what he is to be like. Isaiah chapter 53. And uh, beginning with verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear, he will bear their iniquities. If Jesus had been the son of Joseph, he would have been under a curse. He would never be able to be Messiah. And none of his children that will ever reign as king. They were of the royal line, Jehoiachin, but they couldn't reign because they were under the curse. On the other hand, the line of Nathan was not the royal line. Our, our Lord, when he was on earth, he was looked upon by many people as an earthly king. And many times they tried to make Jesus a king. Now, suppose, just suppose that Jesus had allowed this and he had been accepted as a king. What might have happened? Well, a number of things might have happened, but I have one thing specifically in mind. Any descendant of Solomon could contest Jesus' right to the throne because he came from Nathan. So, how is this resolved? So that it's... Uh, well, how, what do we do about this mess? How do we, how do we, how do we settle it? How do we know that Jesus isn't some usurper to the throne? This is resolved in God's word by a manner so simple that it's the other, it's utter confusion to all those agnostics out there who seek to tear the Bible to pieces. The line that had no curse on it produced Heli and his daughter, the Virgin Mary and her son, Jesus, the Messiah. He is therefore eligible by the line of Nathan, and that exhausts the line. The line of Nathan ends there. The line that had a curse on it produced Joseph, and that exhausts the line of Solomon. It also ends. You see, because Joseph's other children now have an elder brother, half-brother really, who legally and by adoption is the royal heir. And also we can see that these genealogies of Jesus, they're not endless. There is a definite ending. Now, by now, you've got to be thinking, how can the title of Messiah be clear with all this confusion? I mean, a curse on one line <laughs> the lack of royalty on the other one. When the Holy Spirit of God begat the Lord Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary without any use of a human father, the child that was conceived and born was the seed of David according to the flesh. And when Joseph married Mary, 
and took the unborn child under his protecting care, giving him the title that had come to him through his ancestor Solomon, the Lord Jesus became the legal Messiah, the royal Messiah, the uncursed Messiah, the true Messiah, the only possible Messiah. Both lines are now exhausted, terminated. There are no more successors after this. The lines both terminated in Joseph, so there could be no more, no more descendants in this manner. And because Joseph was the legal son and heir of Heli through his marriage to Mary, and because Joseph was also the real son of Jacob, the lines terminate, they end in Joseph. And so they are not needless, idle listening. Folk, if you'd like to take a deeper, deeper look into this whole matter, there's a book that I, can that I can recommend that has a detailed explanation of this. If you're interested, see me afterward and I'll give you the information. But folk, remember this. Any man that ever comes into this world professing to fulfill the conditions of the Messiah would be a liar and a child of the devil, an imposter. So the two genealogies of our Lord are not a stumbling block. They are a vital part of the foundation of our very faith that the, Jesus, the carpenter's son, is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed, very Son of God, virgin born. One final, one final promise that we'll look at this morning. God will always be at work. Slowly, maybe, but perpetually. In your life, in my life, in our church. As long as we are following his word, and not some division divided by men. The universe has been in existence, as you know, for a long, long time. And God took over 2,000 years to give his son to the world. Paul said, but when the right time came, the time God decide, decided on, he sent his son, born of a virgin, born as a Jew. Now, let me be honest with you. There are admitted difficulties with these lists, getting them to harmonize with each other and getting them to harmonize with some other Old Testament facts. But I've tried to show this morning that there are definite lessons to be learned. There are promises to be claimed. A study of these lists can be very, very faith-strengthening because we know that Christ was born the Son of Adam and the Son of God, that he might be a proper mediator. Paul says, a mediator between God and man. And that he might bring the children of Adam to be through him become the children of God. That is his mission. That is what he came to do, and that is what he accomplished. It's, you say, wow, all that from a whole bunch of names? Yes, all that from the genealogy according to Matthew and Luke. Let's pray together. Father, it's a lot to get our arms around with our human understanding. But by faith we understand that Jesus, your Son, and our Savior, the virgin-born Son of God, came to earth, taught us, showed us the example of righteous living, was crucified, died, buried, rose again to save us from our sins and to give to us the gift of eternal life. Father, thank you for that. That's what Christmas really does mean. 
That's the real true bottom line meaning to Christmas. And we thank you for that, Father, because through this, we have the promise of eternal life with you if we accept Jesus as our Messiah, our Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you for your word, Father. May we honor your word by living according to its teaching. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We come now to the time of communion. To prepare our hearts for communion, I want to share something with you. You've heard of the Taj Mahal, I'm sure all of us have heard of it, in Agra, India. The most, it was the most beautiful building in the whole world in, in, at that time. At the time of its construction, it was valued at being worth a hundred million dollars, probably a whole lot more than that now. It was built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan as a memorial to his wife, who he loved, and whose body lies buried beneath the dome of the Taj Mahal. And the emperor is buried beside her. Folk, think about this. It took 5,000 men 16 years to build the Taj Mahal, one of the seven wonders of the world. And across it, is the inscription, to the memory of an undying love. At the beginning of the building of this magnificent structure, the emperor's wife, coffin, was placed in the center of a large parcel of ground, and then they began to construct the Taj Mahal around her coffin. As the weeks turned into months, and the months turned into years, the... Uh, Shaw's grief turned into a passion for this project. He no longer mourned the death of his wife. The construction of the building totally consumed him. One day, while he was walking from one side of the construction to the other, his leg bumped against a wooden box. He brushed the dust off his leg and ordered the worker to throw that box out. Get it out of here. The Shah did not realize that he had just ordered the destruction of the coffin containing the body of his wife. That was the reason, the whole reason the temple was even being built. You know, fortunately, someone discovered that tragedy and the coffin was returned to its intended place. Why do I tell you this? Because I know from my own personal experience that we can do that with our blessed Lord. You say, never, I'd never do that. But, but, but look around sometime. We're so busy keeping the wheels of the church going, we sometimes forget the purpose of the church. We're so concerned sometimes with the mechanics of worship that we forget the purpose of the Lord's Supper. We get so rushed to get on with the activity of worship, we fail to recognize the body of our Lord and Savior, whose death, burial, and resurrection we celebrate at this table. And in so doing, Paul says we eat and drink judgment on ourselves. In our prayer time, as you take the cup and the loaf and the cup, let's remember what the scriptural purpose really is. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? We're going to take the Lord's Supper. In just a few minutes, at this church we practice what we call open communion. That means that if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to join us in the participation 
in the Lord's Supper. It has meaning for you. Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Over the Taj Mahal was the inscription, to the memory of an undying love. Blazoned across the front of this table, it says, this do in remembrance of me. Let's remember Jesus' never-ending love for us. We ask you that you will come from your seat, come the side aisle, come down the center aisle, receive the bread and the cup from the stewards, and then you may either kneel here at the front in prayer or return to your seat and spend some time in prayer as you partake of the Lord's Supper. If you'll turn to him, number, what is it, 251, and be standing as we sing our hymn of dedication. <laughs> As we depart from this place, I want you to hear this scriptural benediction from the book of Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the ti this time on forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Thank God. Thank God. God bless you. Have a good week. We'll see you next week. Real special program next week.
Oh,